Part One. Here, a student called Joanna, telling her friend about an arts festival, which is being held in the city where they are studying. First, you have some time to look at questions one and two. Listen carefully, and answer questions one and two. Hi, Joanna. Where have you been? Hi, Dave. I had to go into college to return a DVD I'd borrowed from the library. Oh, right. But while I was there, I got some information about the City Arts Festival that starts next week. Oh, yeah. I saw a poster advertising it somewhere. Yeah, and I picked up this leaflet from the library. It gives you the website address. So as I was there, I logged on to get more information. Actually, although they've got the full program of events fixed now, you can't book online, which seems strange. There's a number to phone though. Hmm. And are there student discounts? I guess so, but I didn't notice. Anyway, there are three things I'd like to see: an Italian film, a rock concert. And an art exhibition.、Oh. <laughs> the exhibition's free, and you don't need to book, so I'll definitely go to that. But I'm going to get tickets for the film in case they sell out.、Mm, good idea. You can always buy concert tickets at the door because that's in a really big hall. Right. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions three to ten. Now listen, and answer questions three to ten. So, when does the festival actually start? Well, it's usually held the first week of October, but it's earlier this year for some reason. The opening night is September the twentieth, and events go on till the end of the month. Hmm. And have you got that phone number? Yeah, it's here. Uh, look. It's o nine six seven, double nine o, double seven six. Okay, I'll write it down. O nine six seven, double nine o, double seven six. Thanks. I thought the local council made a profit from the festival, but it says here that there's a commercial sponsor. It's a local bank. I didn't know that. Neither did I. What other events have they got on? Um, as well as the art exhibitions and stuff that's open every day, there are special events each day. Like on Monday, there's a musical in the city hall.、Uh. That's only three pounds sixty-five for students. Hmm. I think I'll give that a miss. I've got football training on Mondays, but I'm free on Wednesday. There's a jazz band on then. And that's only two pounds fifty for students. Sounds good. Is that in the city hall too? We could go. Well, I'm busy actually, but it's at the sports centre if you're interested. Oh, right. Thursday's the cheapest event, only one pound twenty-five for students, and it's on in the library. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> Probably the college choir. <laughs> Actually, no, they've not been asked. Apparently, oh, no, it's a poetry evening. Hmm, isn't there any modern dance on anywhere? On Friday, that's at the college. It's quite expensive though, fifteen pounds for adults 
and twelve pounds seventy-five for students.、Oh, yes, that is a lot. If I'm going to spend that much, I'd prefer to go out on Saturday. Yeah, me too. But on Saturday night there isn't live music or a party or anything, just the fireworks in the city park, and that's only one pound fifty. Yeah, that'd be good. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the organizer of a rock festival talking to the exhibitors and performers at a planning meeting. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad you could all make this planning meeting for what promises to be the biggest and most colourful free rock festival ever held in the southeast.、Uh, so whether you're a performer, a craft exhibitor, or an artist, we all extend a big welcome to you.、Uh, could we turn first to the plan so I can familiarise you with the layout of the site, which, as you know, is an old football stadium. We're really lucky to have so much space this year. You can see the main gate at the bottom of the plan. Have you found it?、Uh, that's where most visitors will enter. It's also the entrance for those taking part in the craft fair. We've set the stalls just inside the gate on the left in a circle.、Uh, if you walk straight ahead from the gate along the path without turning right, you'll come to some steps up to the football stadium. On the left of the steps is the fringe stage. This is for alternative artists.、Uh, they include folk singers, poets, and other acts which are more suited to a smaller stage, and they should also enter by the main gate. On the opposite side of the steps is a restaurant, and adjoining that is the main festival information point. Here you can get extra programs and up-to-the-minute information about events, and you can discuss any last-minute problems. Although we hope everything will be running smoothly when the festival opens.、Uh, right,、uh, coming back to the plan, you go up the stairs to the stadium. The entrance for the rock bands is on the far side, and on your right is the main stage, which will have powerful illumination and amplification throughout the weekend. There will probably be TV vehicles adjacent. That's in this area only for recording purposes. If you look at the outside of the plan, you can see a third gate for exhibitors opening onto a side path. A little way down the path, before you get to the trees, is the building where the art exhibition's being housed. Then, finally, there's just one more building marked on your plan, quite near the main gate. It's divided into lock-up garages. So I hope you now feel quite familiar with the main festival area. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. We also hope that you'll have received your welcome pack. In it, you should find two parking tickets for yourself and anyone assisting you, an armband to indicate that you are an official visitor, 
one of our brilliant yellow badges with the new festival logo, uh, festival programme, and several sheets of information that we'd ask you to study carefully before the event. Please could you note that all setting up of stalls, displays and so on should be completed by 9.30am and that, unfortunately, we won't be able to allow any vehicles to enter the festival area after that time. Yeah, it's a big sight, but even a few vehicles parked in the wrong place can block the paths. With crowds of people, and we are expecting several thousand, this can merely be a nuisance, but... If there's an emergency and access for an ambulance is blocked, the situation will become not just annoying, but also dangerous. And don't forget, it could be your mother or your child who needs help. Several exhibitors and craftspeople have asked us if any provision can be made for overnight storage of tables, chairs and display items, rather than having to take them home and bring them again. Uh, we're pleased to say that a limited amount of space has been made available in the building near the main gate. You'll be issued with a yellow ticket to reclaim your property, similar to the red parking tickets, so do check you bring the right one. But please understand that this is entirely at your own risk, as we can take no responsibility for items lost or damaged. Uh, I think that's all I have to say at this point, but thank you all for your attention. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a professor and a student talking about taking a course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Excuse me, Dr. Twain. May I speak with you for a minute? Of course, please come in. I'm Charlotte York. I'm considering taking your course in tourism. Right. Well, Charlotte, how can I help you? I have been considering studying tourism. However, it is such an important decision that I would like to seek some advice about it first. Would you mind answering some of my questions? Absolutely. Fire away. Well, I have been discussing courses with my parents, and they are concerned that I will not be able to get a well-paid job with a degree in tourism. The reason that I want to study the course is that I have a great interest in the subject, and I think I would really enjoy it. I believe the only way that I will enjoy my life is if I enjoy my career. Happiness is far more important than money, don't you think? Absolutely. I would much rather be happy and poor rather than rich and miserable. Money cannot buy you happiness. I'm glad you agree. You needn't worry about money, Charlotte. A large part of the tourism course is dedicated to teaching students how to manage finances a skill that you can apply to your everyday life as well. I would also recommend that you take a sideline course in time management, as this can be incredibly useful in efficiently planning your workload. Efficiency is the key to success. I'll remember that. Now, I have found that some students have natural talents that really help them to succeed in the course. Communication skills, for example, can be very beneficial. Do you have any strengths? Maths was always my favourite subject at school, so I really enjoy solving mathematical problems. However, I find statistics quite difficult. 
I have always been very capable and self-sufficient. I have a lot of confidence in my abilities and will take the initiative in situations without needing to depend on anyone else for their help. That's a really great quality to have, and will be particularly useful if you choose to study tourism. That's great. I would recommend that you spend some of your time researching the course. A lot of people who are uneducated on the subject claim that tourism is a shrinking industry, and that it will become irrelevant in the future. If you study the published research, however, you will see that the truth is quite the opposite. The industry has, in fact, grown significantly as people have developed an ever-increasing interest in culture and travel. Have you compared the university course with a polytechnic? Yes, I have. I was interested in studying the course in modules. However, the university doesn't offer that option. I don't have enough funds to be able to attend an expensive university. So I was relieved to see that the course is quite affordable. I also considered attending a summer school instead of university to save money, and so that I could work during the rest of the year. But I really wanted the university experience. I think that university would suit you well. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Now, what about the courses? Are you interested in any of the other subjects on offer? I have looked at a few. I was interested in travel and business, as it sounds similar to tourism. That is really worth learning. However, be aware that it is difficult and will demand a lot of your time. Okay, that's good to know. You might find that Japanese is an interesting course, and it will teach you valuable skills in speaking the language. Personally, it's not bad and could be of some help, but not that much. Okay, Japanese, got that. What about medical care? Well, if you have time, the course will teach you a lot about curing diseases and illnesses, or dealing with injuries outside. Although it's not essential. So okay, if it's useful, I'll take it. If you enjoy using technology and are worried about fulfilling the entry requirements, computing is very relaxed about the skills that applicants must possess. I'm terrible with computers, so I'm not sure that I would enjoy that course. How about public relations? Yes, I would recommend that course. It would be related to entering the tourism industry. As it will educate you on how to approach clients and develop associations with them. That's great. Thank you so much for your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a talk on the subject of green buildings and skyscrapers. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everyone. Today I am here to talk about the construction of green buildings. Given the current state of the global environment, new types of architecture, design, and construction techniques are absolutely necessary. My brief lecture today will cover two topics: what qualifies a building to receive a green certification, and also how widespread such sustainable buildings currently are. There is a growing demand for so-called green buildings. Government agencies and corporations around the world understand that sustainable workplaces are quite cost-effective in the long run. Though initial outlays for construction are usually more expensive, the savings in maintenance and energy costs make up for it. Here at the Ministry of Environmental Stewardship, we have created a detailed set of requirements that a building must pass in order to be certified as green. For buildings that have already been constructed, we offer two levels of certification: bronze and silver, depending on the number of guidelines implemented. These include reducing or recycling waste products, as well as installing efficient heating and cooling systems. For a gold certification, a building must have had sustainable and environmentally friendly practices from the beginning of its construction. Measures such as using local materials, wood grown from well-managed forests, or reducing the use of toxic chemicals all contribute toward this prestigious distinction. It's pleasing to see how mainstream going green is now. Here at the ministry, however, we know and understand that this cannot be just some passing fad. We created these guidelines so that institutions could not merely greenwash their buildings, claiming that they are environmentally friendly when in fact they aren't. I would now like to talk about some buildings that have received these special certifications. In the 60s, there was a great number of public housing projects built. Over the years, many of them have fallen into gross disrepair. As part of an urban revitalization project, construction companies have consulted with ministry experts to make those council estates a greener and healthier place to live. At Cabrini Fields, lead pipes and lead paint were removed, improving the health of children living there. A system of rooftop and community gardens also helped residents to support themselves. It was one of the first buildings we awarded a bronze certification to. One building with a silver certification is the Mylop Jewett Tower, built over a century ago, and located in the downtown area. The insides of the building were completely scooped out, allowing the construction company to implement innovative new ways of saving energy. The utility bill of the entire building is now 40% down, only 60% of its previous level, despite rising energy costs. Lastly, I would like to talk about the latest building to receive a gold certification from the ministry. Arcadia Arbors is a really great example of green engineering and construction. From the very beginning, the project heads made a really unique plan and held to it. Many of the ministry's guidelines were followed. And we even got ideas for other ways to make buildings sustainable. The centerpiece of this skyscraper is a multi-story hanging garden that serves both an aesthetic and practical purpose. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.